the section where Elihu now speaks. So you'll recall that what we've done is we've uh, found that in the first couple of chapters there are two rounds of conversation between Yahweh and Satan which commences the affliction that uh, then beset Job. Then for the next 20 odd chapters, Job and his three friends who came to commiserate with him appeared to go round and round in circles as they tried to unlock the reason for Job's suffering. As you appreciate, the friends really made no progress in that entire discussion with, with Bildad's last speech in chapter 25 it being somewhat of a summary of Eliphaz's first speech in chapter 4. Because the friends, of course, were limited by their view of exact retribution, this false doctrine of exact retribution, that God deals with people in an immediate sense in this life based on their conduct for good or for bad. And that therefore, though Job appeared to live or be living an extremely godly life, the fact that he was suffering now such grave calamities must mean that he was an out-and-out hypocrite that clearly God was displeased with him, that his external righteousness must be external only, and that he was very, really a very corrupt sinner. And therefore the friends were all about trying to elicit a confession from Job, because it seemed clear to them that he was going to die very, very quickly, and that the best thing that he could do would be confess, to confess his sin and to repent uh, before he died. Well, of course that wasn't true at all. Job wasn't the sinner that they thought he was, And the sins that they began to make up that he had created weren't true at all. In fact, Job was being tried only because uh, of a discussion that Satan had had with God right at the very outset of the book, which, of course, none of the participants therefrom knew about at all. But what happened in the process of Job's three friends going around and around in circles and, and beating him over the head with this continual berating argument of his wickedness was that Even if they made no progress, Job made considerable progress in his understanding of his relationship with God. To such an extent that by the end of chapter 31, Job had lost everything. I mean, he had completely lost everything apart from his character. And nothing could take his character from him. And so he got to the position where he basically said, well, you know, even if God changes his character, I will never, ever change my character. And so, of course, Satan was wrong. Even if Job did lose all the money and all the blessings God gave him, he would never ever curse God. So much so, he says, uh, and as I say, I speak with respect, that even God would leave the truth before Job did. And that's where things had got to at the end of chapter 31. And Job had a number of charges now that he was going to bring against God. Because, uh, well, he believed that God was doing a poor job of ruling the world. God wasn't treating him justly. Uh, And as you have on your handouts... Five at least charges Job thought to bring against God as he desired his day in court. Well, you know, when you come to chapter 32, we introduce the next character of the story, and that's this young man, Elihu. And Elihu's now going to speak between chapters 32 and 37. So this is the next section of the book of Job. And as we mentioned yesterday, there are four rounds or four cycles of speech which Elihu commences upon. Now, the exact place of Elihu in the entire book of Job is a a subject which has given rise to enormous debate, even within the brotherhood. And and the question really is, was he good or was he bad? Does he help the situation here, or does he hinder the situation? Does he just interfere? Now, the problem is made worse by the fact that you could, in fact, cut out the whole speech that Elihu makes here, and the book of Job would read seamlessly, even if you ignore it. I'll show you what I mean. You look at chapter 31, verse 35. At the end of Job's speaking, I mean, Job's hardly going to speak, he's not going to speak anymore after this, apart from when he has some interaction with God at the end. But in verse 35 of chapter 31, as Job concludes his words, he says, Oh, that one would hear me. Behold, my desire is that the Almighty would answer me and that my adversary had written a book. So he wants, he wants God's charges put down on a piece of paper so that he can defend himself against them. Well, you know, when you come to chapter 38, verse 1, God answers him. Oh, he says, that one would hear me, my desire is the Almighty would answer me. That's what he said in chapter 31. Well, in chapter 38, verse 1, 
It says that Yahweh then answered Job out of a whirlwind, Who is this that darkness counts by words without noise? So God does answer him, you see. So my point is, you could delete chapters 32 to 37, and the whole book of Job would read seamlessly as though nothing had ever gone wrong. Well, so what's the need for Elihu? What part does Elihu play, therefore, becomes the question. If, as I say, and as I think you can see, we could omit his entire contribution and still have a perfectly literal reading of the book. In fact, it's been suggested, you know, that Elihu is nothing more than a disrespectful young person who, who bursts into the record uninvited. I mean, you remember that the three friends had made an appointment to come and see Job, but Elihu wasn't part of that appointment. He just turns up in this record. Bursts in uninvited, sounds off against the three friends, which he does. Sounds off against Job, which he does. And doesn't really solve anything because Yahweh still has to come and speak after Elihu's finished, commencing in chapter 38. So the question is, well, what does he do that's of value? He was extremely angry with Job, I might say. Verse 2, well, you know, if, if you've got a coloured pencil, just note the repetition here. Then was kindled the wrath of Elihu, the son of Barakel. Towards the end of the verse, against Job was his wrath kindled. Against the three friends, verse 3, was his wrath kindled. Kindled. Verse 5, when Elihu saw there was no answer in the mouth of these three men, then was his wrath kindled. You see, he comes into the, into the record almost like an angry young man. And he's going to take a piece out of each of them. And, and people have looked at this and said, well, you know, is this just a young man that's lost control of himself? And, and uh, in his immaturity, he comes into this debate uninvited. Well, not quite. The other interesting thing is, you know, Elihu does wait. I mean, he does wait for 20-odd chapters before he even says a word. He appears to have been the silent listener to this whole debate which has been going on up until now. And you can see that this, this almost this tidal wave is building up within him. You look at verse 4. Now, Elihu had waited till Job had spoken. Verse 11, behold, I waited for your words, he says. Verse 16, when I had waited... For they spake not and stood still. So he waits and he waits and he waits until everyone's spoken their piece. Until Job's had his two major soliloquies, the monologues we called him, we, we called them. And then you get to the end of chapter 31 and the words of Job are ended and there's a break in the conversation. The three friends are standing there with their mouths open at what they've just heard Job say. Job's finished it and wiped his hands like this. And now they're looking at each other, at which point Elihu now comes into the picture, having waited and waited and waited. And his anger is building up and up and up and up as he hears what's been going on before him. And he says in verse 18 of, this, of chapter 32, I'm full of a matter, he says. The spirit within me constraineth me. Behold, my belly is as wine which hath no vent. It's ready to burst like new bottles. If I don't say something soon, he says, I'm going to explode. I can't believe what I'm hearing from you three and from you, Job. You see, so this is the the emotion that Elihu comes in to this debate on in the first chapter, from the get-go. He's extremely emotional about what he says. Well, on the other hand, you know, Job wasn't short of answers when he debated with the friends. So my point is, so you can see why Elihu might be thought to have been disrespectful here. But when Job debates with the three friends, he's he's not short of answers at all. He he was very quick to answer them on what they said, very quick to disagree that he'd committed these grave sins of character which they've accused him of. And and when he finally turned his attention to defeating their argument, it was all over in a couple of chapters from about chapter 22 onwards. So Job, there was no shortage of words from Job when he debated with the three friends. But when Elihu starts speaking here in chapter 32, Job says nothing. And Elihu disagrees with him strongly, and Job says nothing. In fact, Elihu invites Job to speak. Come on, you tell me, Job, is that what you said? Have I misinterpreted it? Have I got something wrong? Tell me, answer me, Job, I'm here for you. Silence. Not a word from Job throughout Elihu's speeches. The point is that... It can't simply be that Elihu's just a disrespectful young person that answers, that, that contributes nothing. 
uh, Job, it appears, is unable to answer Elihu. Completely unable to answer Elihu. In uh, verse 6, it tells you here, in chapter 32, Elihu, it says, the son of Barakel the Buzzite, answered and said, I am young, and ye are very old. You remember that Elihu has at least, was at least a generation older than Job, because he was a friend of Job's father. So there was a lot of years between the oldest of the three friends and Elihu has himself. So he comes in and recognises the fact that he's young compared with them. Wherefore, he says, I was afraid and durst not show you mine opinion. I had to defer. I mean, common courtesy alone requires me to defer until the the older brethren have spoken. And he acknowledges that. I said, verse 7, days should speak. The older brethren should speak. Multitude of years should teach wisdom, he says. So there is respect for his seniors in the mouth of Elihu. But the problem was that the multitude of years, in this case, didn't speak a great deal of wisdom. They couldn't defeat Job. In fact, they'd only uh, irritated Job and painted him into a corner and sent Job like a catapult out this way. And now Job's spoken words which are uh, extremely ill-advised. It says says in verse 8, an interesting verse, which I just draw your attention to, verse 8 of chapter 32. But there is a spirit in man, and the inspiration of the Almighty giveth them understanding. Some have read this verse to suggest perhaps that Job might have been inspired. So you see, even across the brotherhood, you've got these extremes of view. That on one hand, Job's a, a presumptuous young person who bursts into a conversation uninvited and adds nothing. On the other end of the extreme, you, you've got the suggestion that Job's in, uh, sorry that Elihu is inspired himself because of, for example, verse eight. Well, I don't think this suggests, by the way, that Job's inspired. Where it says here that the inspiration of the Almighty gives men understanding. I think it's the inspired word that gives men understanding. I don't believe that, the, that this is saying that Elihu is inspired. If Elihu was inspired, he would know the real reason for Job's suffering. He, he would know why this whole thing had gone on. If he was inspired, he'd be speaking directly from God, and you'd have, you've got to say that there would therefore be no need for God to come in and speak separately in chapter 38. So it can't be, see, it can't be that Elihu's an angel. It can't be that Elihu's inspired. Uh, The interesting thing, however, is what I would say is Elihu comes into the record in chapter 32. He disappears from the record in chapter 37. He wasn't part of the appointment that was made in chapter 2. He he, he isn't included with the three friends in chapter 42 when, when God dresses them down for their conduct. So he comes into the record silently, he disappears from the record silently, almost as if he was providentially there to inject this redirection in the argument, comes and goes without notice. It's my belief, brothers and sisters, he adds a vital piece to this argument, an extremely vital piece to this argument. In fact, I'd go so far as to suggest that if we did take a penknife and we cut the chapters of Elihu out of the the book of Job and we went from chapter 31 straight into chapter 38, then God's dealing with Job's and chapter 38 might might well have been catastrophic. I, I mean, he might well have killed Job. Understand, Job is extremely aggressive in chapter 31. He's brought these charges against God and he is furious in chapter 31. If when the voice comes from the whirlwind in chapter 38 to answer Job, Job had gone straight to God with the aggression he had in chapter 31, I don't think the conversation would have lasted very long. And Elihu brings some reality to this discussion, which Job cannot answer, which probably saves Job's life. So there's a lot at stake, you know, when you start to read the words of Elihu. Well, who was he? Well, verse 1 says, chapter 32, verse 1, These three men, the friends, ceased to answer Job because he was righteous in his own eyes. And that was true. Then was kindled the wrath of Elihu, the son of Barakel, the Buzzite, of the kindred of Ram. Against Job was his wrath kindled because Job had justified himself rather than God. He's a Buzzite, it says. In Genesis 2, in verse 21, Buzz was a descendant of Nahor, the brother of Abraham. So, like the friends, Elihu was a distant relation of Job. Elihu, the word, the name Elihu, and this is important, Elihu means God is he. God is he. 
And straight away that gives you a clue to Elihu's purpose. Because you see, we read in, in chapter 31 and verse 35, Job's desire was that the Almighty would answer him. He wanted an audience with God. And earlier in the discussion, Job had talked about how that audience might be obtained. And because Job realized, recognized or believed earlier on that he couldn't stand and, and speak to God directly. He couldn't have a personal audience with God. What he needed was a mediator, an umpire, a daysman. And you read about that in chapter 9, verses 32 and 33. And what, why did Job need an umpire? Well, because God was too powerful for Job. God could just destroy him. He could overwhelm him in a moment. He could terrify him. And the purpose of the discussion that, that Job wanted to have was God, with God was for God to tell Job what he'd done wrong. To tell Job what he'd done to de- deserve all the suffering that he was going through. Well, you look what Elihu says here. Chapter 33, verse 6. Well, he says to Job, God is he, right? Well, he says, Behold, I am according to thy wish in God's stead. But I also am formed out of the clay. You wanted somebody, Job, to represent your case to God or God's case to you. Well, I'm going to stand here and do it for you. Elihu means God is he. And you can see where this is going, brothers and sisters. He says, I am according to thy wish in God's stead, but I'm also formed out of the clay. You might like to take a note. Matthew 1 verse 23. Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son. They shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. I am according to thy wish in God's stead. He's going to represent God to man, you see. But I also am formed out of the clay. Hebrews 2 verse 14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. So he could represent God to man, but he could still understand man's condition because he's also formed out of the clay. He's not God. He's not an angel. He's not inspired. He's just a friend. But you can see what Elihu's done. Job has justified himself rather than God. And Elihu says, Job, you've made a great mistake here. You've made a very big mistake. Job wants a vindicator. He wants an umpire so that he can go to law with God. Elihu says, well, I can't do that for you, Job. I can't represent your position to God. But I can represent God's position to you. You want to have the argument, Job? You want to have the argument with God? Have it with me. If you can defeat me, then by all means, take the argument directly to the throne of heaven. But if you can't defeat me, maybe you want to reconsider whether you really want to take this argument to God. Because if you can't defeat me, and here I am made out of clay just like you, here I am just a man. If you can't even defeat me, God will kill you. So you wanted the umpire, well here I am. I'll offer myself, Job. Have the argument now. Chapter 33, verse 5. If you can answer me, set thy words in order before me. Stand up, he says. Go on then, Job. Give me your best shot. Show me your argument. You know, that's set thy words in order before me, stand up. That's exactly what God says to Job in chapter 38, verse 3. When the voice comes from the whirlwind, gird up thy loins like a man, he says, for I will demand of thee, answer thou me. Stand up and give me your answer, says God to Job. We see Elihu's begun it by saying exactly the same thing to Job here in chapter 33. But of course, you'll appreciate, arguing with Elihu was a very different proposition to answering with God. Verse 7. Behold, Elihu says, My terror shall not make thee afraid, neither shall my hand be heavy upon thee. Isn't that exactly what Job wanted? Remove thy hand from me. Don't terrify me. Isn't that what Job asked that, that, this, that, that uh, God should do if he was going to go and take his case to God? Elihu says, I can't affect you like this. I can't overwhelm you. I can't destroy you. I'm just a man like you. So, there's the point. If you think you've got a good case to take to God, take it to me first. Because if you can't defeat me, you clearly can't defeat God. So, pretty important, as I'm going to suggest, Elihu's intervention in this whole record. Extremely important. You come across, turn the page, chapter 3, verse 32. 
here's what Elihu is going to do for Job. He says in uh, chapter 33 and verse 32, If thou hast anything to say, Job, answer me. Speak, for I desire to justify thee. I'm on your side, Job. I genuinely want to vindicate you, Job. So you see Elihu's position. He, he, he wasn't part of the group that came to see Job. And he wasn't part of the appointment. He just turns up in the midst of this discussion. He says his piece and he leaves. He leaves. Perhaps before the end. I mean, he might have, he might have been right there at the end when he heard the voice of God. But he's not addressed by God, whereas the three friends are. He just remains silent. A vital, a vital injection into the whole course of this argument by Elihu. Well, Elihu's approach is to start quoting back Job's arguments to him and then to answer them. And I'll show you how this, I'll show you how this all works out. There are a number of, and it's as well to be aware of this, there are a number of places in the next few chapters where, Job, where Elihu quotes Job's words, and that forms the entire basis for Elihu's answer. So I recommend get a pencil out or something, and I'll just circle these verses that I tell you, because you have to understand when Elihu is speaking his own words and when he's actually quoting what Job says back to Job. And there's a half a dozen places, that's all, across these chapters. So here we start. We start in chapter 33, verse 9. And, well, you can see, verse 8, Surely, Job, thou hast spoken in my hearing, I have heard the voice of thy words, saying. Okay, so verses 9, 10, 11 are a verbatim quote from Job. So Elihu, verses 19 and 11 of chapter 33, and Elihu's words, they are Elihu quoting Job. And the point is that what Elihu says in verses 9 to 11 is the basis for what he answers, you see. Similarly, verse 13, so 19 and 11, put a box around them. Verse 13, why dost thou strive against God? And where it says for, it will be saying, and this is a quote from Job, saying, he giveth not account of any of his matters. Who can understand what God does? You, you pray to him, he doesn't answer you. you. You look around and there's no explicable reason why things happen. So that last half of verse 13 is another quote from Job. Chapter 34, verse 5, for Job had said, verses 5 and 6, a quote from Job. Verse 9 of chapter 34, for he had said, it profited the man nothing that he should delight himself with God. There's another quote from Job. So you see, it's as well to understand where Elihu's speaking his own opinion and when he's quoting Job. Finally, chapter 35, verse 2. Thinkest thou this to be right, that thou saidst, and here's the quote, my righteousness is more than God's, for thou saidst, verse 3, what advantage is it to thee? So verses 2 and 3, he's quoting Job. And finally, verse 14, chapter 35, verse 14. Although thou sayest, thou shalt not see him, so forth. There's the final quote from Job. So you can see, Elihu is simply quoting what Job said back to Job, and then saying, and this is how I would answer you. I'm not going to answer you like the friends answered you. I'm not going to copy their argument. I don't agree with their argument. But this is what I think you should think about, based on what you've said. And Elihu, by the way, believes that Job has sinned. I mean, the three friends believed he had sinned, but the three th friends say that Job has sinned, uh, sins, historical sins, sins of hypocrisy which he's, he's committed, which they're trying to get a confession from. Elihu, when Elihu talks about Job's sin, he only re refer refers to the Job's sin in the debate. Job's sin by making himself more righteous than God. He doesn't believe Job's committing these secret sins all through his life. He's, he's going to say that you have sinned, Job, in the discussion in the last few hours. That's the sin I want to talk about. The rest, no, no, I don't believe you're the hypocrite that the friends say you are. You say he's very, very much more level-headed than all the rest. Well, okay, he begins here, chapter 33, verse 8. There are four speeches. Chapter... 32 is the introduction, but 33 is his first speech, 34 is the second speech, 35 is the third speech, and chapters 36 and 37 together are the four speeches of Elihu. So here's the first speech, chapter 33. Verse 8. Surely, Job, 
Thou hast spoken in mine hearing, and I've heard the voice of thy words, saying, I'm clean without transgression, I'm innocent, neither is there iniquity in me. Behold, God finds occasions against me, he counteth me for his enemy, he putteth my feet in the stocks, he marketh all my paths. Now what you find is that Elihu quotes Job, he quotes him here, he quotes him elsewhere, as we've said. Uh, not always does Elihu get it right. And this is one of the other points that proves Elihu's not inspired. Sometimes he does overstate what Job says. Sometimes he does, you know, he's interpreted what Job says and put his own meaning on it. And sometimes he gets a little bit wrong. Job doesn't always say exactly what Elihu quotes back. But Elihu gets the general gist of Job's argument absolutely right. But my point is, the fact that he makes some small mistakes means that he's not inspired. But his argument is basically sound. Well, here's Job's major point. He's suffering in these few verses we just read. He's suffering, but he's done nothing to deserve it. Uh, Not that Job thinks he's sinless, but that he's forgiven. So when he says here, um, Job says he believes he's clean without transgression and innocent, Job knows, of course, that he sins, but if he's forgiven, then he's made clean, of course. His major issue is that his suffering is out of all proportion to any sins that he might have done. And what's more, verse 13, God gives no account of his matters. God won't answer me. At least in this life, he doesn't talk to men. So you can never even find out what God's will is with you and what he might be punishing you for if that's the case. Well, says Elihu, let's talk about how man communicates with God. There are three ways in which God communicates with man. Verse 14. For God speaketh once, yea, twice, yet man perceives it not. So he says there are two ways in which God speaks to man. And when you turn the page to chapter 33, verse 29, you'll find that he says, Lo, all these things worketh God oftentimes with man. You see your margin there for oftentimes, twice and thrice. And so what Elihu does in chapter 33 is he explains the three ways that God communicates with man. And here's the first one, verse 15. In dreams, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falleth upon men, in slumberings upon the bed. So, the first way God communicates with man is he gives them visions. That that happens, Job. God actually does communicate with man. The creation and, and God's rule of creation is not a complete mystery at all. He does tell men, certain men, what he's doing. That's the first way. Here's the second way God communicates with man. Verse 19. Man is chastened also with pain upon his bed, and the multitude of his bones with strong pain. Now, Elihu's going to make this a method of communication. You say, where's the communication? Elihu's point, and I'll come to this in a subsequent chapter where Elihu explains it in detail. God communicates with man through suffering. Now this is a brand new point in the debate. No one's ever said this in the discussion. God's voice is heard in the providential experiences of life. That's Elihu's point. Job couldn't help to see himself in this, you know, because look, Elihu goes on, so that a man's life abhorreth bread, his soul dainty meat, his flesh is consumed away. You know, these are words that directly apply to Job. So Elihu says, God communicates in visions. Well, everyone knew that. God communicates through providential experience of life. It might be suffering, it might be other things. That's a brand new point. That's Elihu's second point. And the third way, he says, that God communicates with man is by messengers. Verse 23. If there be a messenger with man, an interpreter... One among a thousand to show unto man God's uprightness. Now you notice I changed a couple of words here. It's difficult to understand verse 23. When, when scripture just uses the word his, you've got to f- figure out whether the his is a person or whether it's God. And I think that's the correct understanding. Is, if there be a messenger with him, that is with man, an interpreter, one among a thousand to show unto man his, that is God's uprightness. God sends mediators. God sends messengers to man to represent God. And this is the place that Elihu fulfills in Job's life at this point in time. He's going to represent God's character to Job. And he's going to offer Job the opportunity to debate with him. And if Job can't beat him, 
then he'd better not try and debate with God, you see. And this, of course, is what sets Elihu apart from the friends. One among a thousand, he makes the point. This is an, an extremely unique man that God sends to man, who is an interpreter who can explain God's character to man. That's his point. Who can interpret scripture for man. In in verse 24, the messenger will be gracious to man, this messenger, and this messenger will say to God, deliver man from the pit, because I've found a ransom, an atonement. So this messenger will come and speak atonement for man. What's the point? Well, the point, the, the simple doctrinal point that Elihu makes here is in verse 24, deliverance is on the basis of the ransom. Or as the margin says, the atonement. Deliverance from death comes on the basis of atonement. And verse 28, verse, yes, verse 27, 28, atonement comes on the basis of confession. Verse 27 says, God looks upon men, and if any man says, I've sinned and perverted that which is right, and it profited me not, then God will deliver his soul from going down to the pit. So the minute a man confesses that God's right and he's wrong, atonement can take place. And this life, he says, God sends messengers to men. Those messengers come and they represent God's righteousness or God's character to man. If the man confesses, his, his wickedness and God's righteousness, then God can cover that sin and save him from death. That's the third way that God communicates with man. You see? And this is very important at this time that Elihu says this because we'll co- look across the, the column at chapter 34, verse 5. What's Job's problem? Well, Job has said, says Elihu, I'm righteous and God's taken away my judgment. I'm righteous and God's not. Or or chapter 35, verse 2. Thinkest thou this to be right, that thou saidst, Job, my righteousness is more than God's? Job's got a major misunderstanding of the character of God versus his character. And Elihu says, uh, God sends messengers to men to represent to them God's character compared with their own. And and the minute a man says, uh, uh, I have sinned, verse 27 of chapter 33, I have perverted that which is right, then God can deliver man. But God does have to send one man among a thousand to the multitude to just help, help them understand the difference between their characters and God's. And this is the role that Elihu plays, you see. And in all the communication God has with man, the objective is the same. Now you look, look at the, the similarity between, or well, verse 18, chapter 33, verse 18. God keeps back man's soul from the pit and his life from perishing. Verse 22, Yea, his soul draws near to the grave and his life to the destroyers. Verse 24, Then he is gracious to man and says, Deliver him from the pit. Verse 28, God will deliver man's soul from going to the pit. Verse 30, To bring back his soul from the pit. You see, this is all about saving man from death. That's the purpose of God's communication to him. And what did I say? About five verses there I read you. All the same point in this, in this particular section. That's why God communicates with man, you see. Well, I think it's fair to say, brothers and sisters, Job just hasn't seen it like this before. He hasn't thought that this might be the case. Look, verse 32. Uh, Job, if thou hast anything to say, answer me. Speak now, Job. If I've, if I've got this wrong, if I'm misrepresenting you, if I'm misrepresenting God, you think, tell me now. Speak, for I desire to justify thee. Uh, but if not, if I haven't got it wrong, Job, then listen to me. Hold thy peace, and I'll teach thee wisdom. I think you've gone too far, Job. But, but please tell me if I've misinterpreted anything. Silence. <laughs> Absolute silence from Job, you see. Eli's right, isn't he? He's right. Well, Job, so that's in the chapter 33. Chapter 34, second speech. Verse 5, Job, you say, I'm righteous and God has taken away my judgment. In fact, Job, you say, verse 9, it profiteth a man nothing that he should delight himself with God. What's the point of being in the truth? That's what you're saying, Job, isn't it? That's what you're saying. Let's take these one at a time. Verse 10. Therefore hearken to me, 
you men of understanding. Far be it from God that he should do wickedness, and from the Almighty that he should commit iniquity. God is not wicked, Job. It's just not true. God is not unrighteous, he's not unjust, he's not wicked. Verse 14. If God set his heart upon man, if he gather unto himself his spirit and his breath, then all flesh would perish together, and man would return to the dust. God is omnipotent. He is all-powerful. And Job, I might say, if God really did want to kill you, what's taking him so long? If God really did want to kill you, as you believe, you'd be dead already. He'd just go, withdraw it, and you'd fall to the ground in an instant. Well, that hasn't happened, Job. So it doesn't appear to me that God does want to kill you. Because it seems very obvious to me that if he wanted to, it would happen before we finished the sentence. Perhaps, therefore, there's another reason for your suffering. You see, he's, he's pretty astute, Elihu. He's starting to put things together, isn't he? Verse 21, chapter 34, verse 21. For God's eyes are upon the ways of man. He seeth all his goings. God is omniscient. He does know everything. He knows about the injustice in creation. He knows all of these things. And I might say, sometimes he deals with that. Look at verse 20, chapter 34, verse 20. In a moment shall they die. And the people shall be troubled at midnight. And pass away, and the mighty shall be taken away without hand. Look around, Job. Just cast your mind back across history. Don't you find it strange that sometimes unexpected things happen, unbelievable things happen, and people who are in high positions all of a sudden die? They just get taken out of the way. Because God is trying to change the direction of his creation. It happens... Uh, to the least expected person at the least expected time, but major things change. God is in control, actually, of creation, Job. He might not be controlling it like you want, but there's no question he's in control of creation because look at the obvious providential things that happen around us. Verse 31, chapter 34, verse 31. Surely it is meet to be said unto God, that is to say, the right response to God is, I have borne chastisement, I will not offend any more. Humble yourself, Job. That which I see not, verse 32, teach thou me. If I have done iniquity, I will do no more. Isn't that what you should be saying, Job? Don't accuse Job of a God of injustice, Job. Humble yourself before God. But understand this. As I say, Elihu's not supporting the doctrine of the three friends here. When he talks about Job's iniquity, the iniquity that I believe he speaks of is the iniquity in the debate. Job's allegations, Job's accusations against God, of God's injustice and so forth. That's Job's iniquity, not any of this nonsense about secret sins. Chastening is a means of communication from God, not just punishment. In fact, verse 36, my desire is that Job may be tried unto the end because of his answers for wicked men, or as it it should be, because of his answers like a wicked man. Job, until you learn your right place with God, I can't see any reason for the suffering to stop. My desire is that the suffering continues until you come to your senses, because that's the purpose of it, Job. Rebelling against trial won't get you anywhere. For God to remove the trial that you're currently under, Job, would be the worst possible thing for you. I mean, it sounds pretty tough what Elihu's saying, but that's basically where he's up to. Job, with you, God's got to be cruel to be kind. And to have removed the trial before now would not have done, obviously, what he wants to do. That's the end of the second speech. Third speech, chapter 35. Now let's come back to another point, Job. Chapter 35, verse 3. You say, What advantage will it be unto thee? What profit shall I have if I be cleansed from my sin? Or as the New International Version says, What profit is it to me? And what do I gain by not sinning? So Job now contemplates, for, for a fleeting moment, contemplates the prospect of leaving the truth. He said, well, you know, I could just... What's the point of being righteous? Now, you know that by the end of Job's speech, he says, there's every point of being righteous. But throughout the debate, he had said this. He says, well, you know, 
on living. The, the wicked prosper. Nothing goes wrong for them. They have big families. They live a long time. But here am I, living a, an extremely godly life, marking every one of my steps. Well, but look, and look what's happening to me. Well, a thinking man might say, what's the point of this? Well, Elihu quotes him back and says, now you have said this, Job. What's the point of not sinning? Well, he says, the first point is that ultimately, whether you sin or whether you don't sin, you really can't affect God. Verse 6. If thou sinnest, what doest thou against him, God? Or if thy transgression be multiplied, what doest thou unto him? So you see, if you see sufferings as a punishment from God, and you decide to punish God back by sinning, you should understand that your punishment won't work. No, verse 8. Thy wickedness may hurt a man as thou art, and thy righteousness may profit the Son of Man, certainly your conduct can affect yourself, it can affect other people. But understand that if you decide to punish God because of, like, how many of you ever thought to do this, brothers and sisters? Things aren't going well in life. You think God's down on you for some reason, so you say, well, it's not fair. This shouldn't be happening to me. But because it's happening to me, I'm going to take a liberty. I'm going to do something Ungodly. I'm going to do something I shouldn't do because God should understand. It's a very human thing to do, actually. It might sound alarming that I'd suggest that you, you of all people, could do such a thing. I think that. You think that. Elihu says, you can't affect God by whether you sin or whether you don't sin. You can certainly affect people by whether you sin, but it can't do anything to God. Never think to punish God back. For how things are going in life, by doing something before him which he doesn't like. Never think to do that, Job. In fact, he says, you know, you've been, you've been praying, Job. Verse 13. Surely God will not hear vanity, neither will the Almighty regard it. A consistent life, Job, is a prerequisite to answered prayer. So if things aren't going as you, as you would like them to go, and you decide to punish God back for how he's treating you, don't pretend that he's going to listen to your prayers. You're only going to start the spiral downwards, Joe, if you think like this. Amazing, isn't it, to see this sort of thing recorded in Scripture. So, verse 16, Therefore doth Job, says Elihu, Therefore doth Job open his mouth in vain. He multiplieth words without knowledge. You say, verse 14, Job, that God doesn't listen to my case when it's right in front of him. My face is, my case is right in front of God and he's not listening to me. And then verse 15, Job, you say further that, that uh, God's anger never punishes. It doesn't take the least notice of wickedness. God, God doesn't act against wickedness. But as I say, Job, in verse 13, a godly conduct or a consistent life is a prerequisite for answered prayer. God doesn't hear vanity will just be glad he doesn't. Because if God did answer your prayer in the frame of mind you're in now, he might punish you even more. Just be glad God doesn't answer the prayer of inconsistent people. Change your life, Job, and then re-approach God in prayer. End of the third speech, fourth speech, chapter 36. You see, this is an extremely astute argument from Elihu. Now, Joe, let's talk about the chastening of God. Let's talk about this whole suffering thing. Chapter 36, verse 7. Look at this, brother. This is, this is most interesting. 36, verse 7. God withdraweth not his eyes from the righteous, but with kings are they on the throne. Yea, he doth establish them forever. They are exalted. And if they be bound in fetters and be holden in cords of affliction, then God shall them their work and their transgressions that they have exceeded. He openeth also their ear to discipline and commandeth that they return from iniquity. What is that saying? Verse 7. Point 1. The righteous are kings with God. He doesn't oppress them. He exalts them. That's how God views the righteous. Verse 9. When things go wrong for us, we examine our lives very carefully. That's what happens to us. When, when, things, when the chips are down for all of us, we examine our lives very carefully. And often the first question we ask is, what have I done to deserve that? Well, that's a fair enough question. 
Uh, exact retribution isn't true, but that's probably not an unhealthy question to ask because you could ask that question every day. Verse 10. Then we listen to God. When things go bad, we listen to God. Look at verse 15. God delivers the poor in his affliction. He openeth their ears in oppression. Be honest. When do you offer your best prayers? When things are going well? Or when things are going not so well? And imagine, you know the answer to that, imagine your prayers were getting a bit lackluster. Imagine you weren't praying as conscientiously as you should be. And God says, I want to hear more from you. What should he do? He delivered the poor in his affliction. He openeth their ears in oppression. So if your father wants to talk to you and he wants you to listen, how should he achieve that? He opens our ears in oppression. And Job has never thought of this before. And Elihu says, this is a bombshell in Job's life. Elihu says, Job, you say that God's unintelligible. You, you say you, you can't talk to him. He doesn't answer you. He's talking to you now, Job. Suffering and trial is a major means of communication from God to the saints. Because it's when they give their best prayers. It's when they are most attentive, when things aren't going well. <laughs> so God wants to talk to us. However, should he begin that discussion? It says it right there, doesn't it? And verse 16. Even so, would God have removed thee out of the strait into a broad place where there is no straightness? And, and that which should be said on my table should be full of fatness. You know what, Job? If you had been more attentive to God's uh, conversation with you before now, the suffering would have already stopped. <laughs> Isn't it true? That's exactly what it says in verse 16. If you had been listening to what God was trying to teach you, we wouldn't be having this discussion right now. So, Job, don't be tempted. Verse 20. Desire not the night when people are cut off in their place. This is a reference to death. Don't ask to die, Job. Don't wish that the grave would close over you. Verse 21. Take heed. Regard not iniquity. Don't, don't respond to God's discipline by turning to evil, Job. Don't do that. Verse 26. Behold, God is great, Job. We know him not. Neither can the number of his years be searched out. God is infinite. We can't begin to comprehend him. He is in control. He does love the righteous. He is just. And there is value in serving him. Your values aren't wrong, Job. Your conclusions are right. You're just not listening to the discussion from your father. But look, verse 27. For God maketh small the drops of water. They pour down rain according to the vapour thereof. Do you know, as they were speaking, as they were beginning to have this discussion, it started to rain. Little drops, you know, one here, one there. Elihu actually first notices this, the weather changing, as they're having this discussion, they're outside, because Job's outside the city, remember, scratching himself with potsherds uh, beside the ashes of the fireplace. They're outside, and Elihu first notices the clouds beginning to darken overhead back in chapter 35 and verse 5. Uh, at that time he was comparing man's, uh, God's immunity to man's activity, and he says, look to the heavens, look how great God is, he says. And already the sky at that point was beginning to cloud over, and it had attracted Elihu's attention. Well now, we've got the first drops of rain beginning to happen in verse 27. Verse 32, with clouds, he covereth the light, and he commandeth it not to shine because, sorry, by the cloud that comes betwixt. So now the clouds have moved in front of the sun in verse 32, and the whole place is getting dark. Chapter 37, verse 2. Hear attentively the noise of his voice and the sound that, sound that cometh out of his mouth. So there's thunder in the distance, you see. There's a storm beginning to happen. Verse 4. 
After it, a voice roareth. He thundereth with the voice of his excellency. He will not stay then when his voice is heard. So now there's thunder nearby. And the voice of God and the thunder that that Elihu's described is getting louder and louder as the storm comes upon them. Verse 9. Out of the, the south, or as it is, out of the chamber cometh the whirlwind. And cold out of the north. So there's a north wind, a cold north wind blowing towards them. And verse 15. Thus then know when God disposes them and causes the light of his cloud to shine. What's that? Well, now the clouds are lighting up. There's lightning, isn't there? There's lightning. So, so the wind, there's this cold wind blowing from north and this light, the whole place is getting dark. They can no longer see the sun and the clouds are lighting up like this. There's lightning zips from one side of the sky to the other. Verse 16. Thus then know the balancing of the clouds, the wondrous works of him which is perfect in knowledge. So now the clouds, the balancing, he says, they're starting to move around like this. They're starting to circle these clouds around about them. Verse 17. How thy garments are warm when he quieteth the earth by the south wind. So oh, the wind has changed direction. It's now come from the south. And the earth's gone quiet. What does that mean? The birds have stopped chirping. The cattle have stopped lowering. All the animals around them. Everything's gone extremely silent. Everything's gone to ground. Everything's gone into its burrow. All the animals, the, the livestock are probably lying down. This is getting quite serious here with the weather. And everything's quiet. No birds, no sound of livestock. All the animals are hiding. Everything in creation has stopped. And now the clouds are starting to move faster and faster overhead above them. Verse 18. Hast thou with God spread out the sky, which is strong, and it is a molten looking glass. Now the sky looks like metal above them, you see. And the vault of heaven is sealed. And there's lightning darting from one side of the clouds to the other, reflecting off them. Verse 19 teaches what we shall say unto God. For we cannot order our speech by reason of the darkness. So now they can't even hardly see each other. And here they are, these three friends. They're standing on one side. There's Job sitting there on the ground. There's Elihu standing. And he's relating what he says to the the storm that's brewing overhead. And it's just got darker and darker and darker and darker like this. As they're having this discussion, Elihu just keeps speaking. Verse 27. Sorry. Yes. 22, he says. Sorry. Fair weather, he says. Comes out of the north. With God is terrible majesty, he says. Now that's interesting. Fair weather. Look at your margin. What what is this verse saying? Fair weather cometh out of the north. The margin says gold cometh out of the north. Now, this would normally be a reference to the sun. The problem is the sun doesn't come from the north. What is this, brothers and sisters? What is happening here? They're in the middle of a storm. The sun has already been obscured, we read earlier, by the clouds. But there's a light in the north. Gold, the margin says, there's a light in the north. Out of the north, a bright light coming from the north. What is it? I'll tell you what it is. Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 4. I looked, and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north. A great cloud and fire enfolding itself, and brightness was about it. It's the Shekinah glory. A light has come from, this is the presence of God now coming upon this discussion. And a great light has come from the north. And immediately as this, as this whirlwind starts to take over, then Yahweh, verse 1 of chapter 38, answers Job out of the whirlwind and says, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Get up now thy loins like a man, I will demand of thee, and answer thou me. And all of a sudden we're into the discussion between Yahweh and Job as the Shekinah has come right above them from the north and the storm has completely enveloped them. And they're cocooned in this cloud and in this darkness. And Job's now going to start his interview with God. Extremely dramatic situation. Do you know there's something even more powerful here than that? And it's contained in Elihu's last words. In verse 23 of chapter 37. Touching the Almighty, Elihu says, we can't find him out. He's excellent in power and in judgment and in plenty of justice. He will not afflict. Now, Elihu probably can see, as he sees the the shining in the north, he probably realises what it is. 
And before he gets completely drowned out by the noise of the storm and the voice of God, he puts in one last comment to Job and says, this is the character of the God we love, Job, in verse 23. You might like to take a note. Lamentations 3, verses 32 and 33 says this. But though he caused grief, yet will he have compassion to the multitude of his mercies. For he doth not afflict willingly, nor grieve the children of men. It doesn't give God pleasure to see his, to his children suffer. But it's a necessary discipline for kings, brothers and sisters. Alright, so here's the final question. Why do you suppose God appears to Job in a whirlwind? Do you think it's to demonstrate, to demonstrate God's majesty? Perhaps it's so that all other external influences are removed and they're, and they're cocooned in this cloud and in this darkness and they can have a very attentive discussion with God. Perhaps it's to show Job how small he is compared with the creator of heaven and earth. Why do you think God answers Job in chapter 38 out of a whirlwind? Well, you know, I think, I don't think it's any of those reasons I just gave you. I think there's one preeminent reason. And that's contained back in chapter 1. Look at this. And when you see this, if you haven't already realised, it's the obvious reason. Chapter 1, verse 18. Why does God appear to Job in a whirlwind? Well, verse 18, it says in chapter 1, While he was speaking, there came also another and said, Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young men, and they are dead. And I only am escaped to tell thee. What kind of a wind, brothers and sisters? What kind of a wind is it that hits four corners of a house at the same time? It's a wind from the north, south, east and west, isn't it? What kind of a wind is that? It's a whirlwind. It's a whirlwind. You see what Job thought? You see what God thought? God knew what really hurt Job and all of these sufferings, didn't he? It was his children. And who was the God, brothers and sisters, that Job really wanted to talk to about the suffering he was going through? It wasn't just the God of creation. It was the God of the whirlwind. It was the God that killed his children. Isn't that the God that Job wanted to talk to? And so in chapter 38, in comes this Shekinah, this great storm builds up, and Elihu notices the drops of rain coming down and the clouds swirling around, and it goes through, the wind comes from the north, the wind comes from the south. It's obviously changing direction. The clouds are circling. The... the, the uh, the darkness overshadows them. The, the whirlwind comes above them and God speaks from the whirlwind because that's the God that Job wanted to talk to. The God that killed his children in a whirlwind. That's the very God that he wanted to talk to. You see, Job's position was you can have the business, you can have the money, you can have everything. Why do you have to kill my children? Isn't that right? Isn't that really the issue for Job? But you know, Job now understands something. He understands that suffering comes for all sorts of reasons. He wasn't suffering because he had sinned. His children didn't die because they had sinned. That God is righteous. That he does have the best interests of his servants at heart. And Job has now had a mediator which has prepared him for God, which has represented God's character to him and could show him God's righteousness. So now he's going to go into this debate and he understands something about God which he hadn't considered before. I don't say he didn't understand it before. He hadn't considered it in the extremity of his affliction before. Well, let's finish. I'm looking at my clock. So let's finish. Romans chapter 8. Well, how did we take that to the emblems, brothers and sisters? Well, isn't this the way? Romans chapter 8. In these last words, Job was a very bitter man about losing his children. He never said it, but I think the whirlwind proves it. Because there were many ways that God could have spoken to Job at the end. From this story, now there is something that Job could never know, but which we all know, and it's this. God never asked Job to endure anything that he wouldn't endure himself. And here it is in Romans chapter 8 and verse 31. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? 
He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall, he, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? That's the God of the whirlwind, you see. Job lost his children. God lost his son. At least in Job's case, the children died without suffering. That wasn't true of God's son. But God raised his son. And I believe the inference from Job 42 is that he will also raise Job's children. Job will see his seed. He will see his children again. But of course, in the death of God's son, brothers and sisters, we, with Job, can all have life.